Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today, Navigating the Australian Immunisation Handbook. Uh, my name is Jenny Pearson. I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Today we have Rebecca, Kirsty and Sharon, all from the Public Health Unit. Rebecca's going to be presenting for us today and Kirsty and Sharon are going to facilitate the Q&A box. So please type in your questions. Um, and if we get a lot, we will stop partway through and we can answer some, otherwise we'll just wait until the end. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available in our education library. You will also receive a certificate um, at the end and there will be a very quick generic evaluation. If you could quickly fill that in, we'd really appreciate it. All right, I think that's all you need to hear from me. I'll hand over to you, Rebecca. Okay, hi everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Rebecca. I'm one of the immunisation clinical nurse consultants um, for Hunter New England Public Health Unit. Um, we put together this presentation today based on some of the feedback from our um, last immunisation update that the immunisation handbook is, is huge um, and you'd like the opportunity to, to sit down and have a bit of a tour and some tips and tricks of the handbook. So that's the purpose of what we're going to go through today. Um, hopefully you can already see my screen. Um, and what I'm going to do is actually just go through the handbook live for us today in showing you some of the, the handy spots to go to. So if we can, I just want to start by, by how to get there if you don't already have it saved. So obviously we would be typing in the Australian book. If, we, if you Google the handbook, this first hit that you get here is going to take you to an Australian government page which where the handbook lives. This is not the handbook itself. So we're wanting to do an extra click to get to the purple page, which is the actual handbook. Um, why we have an extra click, who knows? The answer to a lot of things today, why is it like that is who knows, but it is what it is. Um, so if you favourite that handbook, this is actually the, the crux of um, your authority to immunise is that you're going to immunise as per what this handbook says. So having it available is a part of your, your clinical practice and really important. Um, so that's the first point ticked off. Um, once you land here, these quick links are, are quite helpful. Um, so one of the most handy ways to navigate the handbook is via vaccine preventable disease. So you could do it by clicking on this quick link, or you can do it by, if you're back here home, clicking on diseases. And that's gonna bring you up your, your list of every vaccine preventable disease. You might be using this when you've got a scenario that might be, we've got a 32 year old man in the waiting room with a prescription for a HPV vaccine. Do I really want to give that? Um, and that's where you might be coming here to the HPV section of the handbook, which is going to tell us all the recommendations for HPV vaccine. These chapters are big, they're meaty, Using these hyperlinks at the top is really handy. So for our scenario, we're trying to find out if um, a HPV vaccine is recommended for our patient in the waiting room. You're going to click on recommendations. And that's where we go down and we've got a few groups that HPV vaccine is recommended for. The standard group is um, what has recently been changed is for one single dose for all people um, can be given from age nine to 25. Optimal time for vaccination is between 12 and 13 years. So our man in the waiting room, who's a 32 year old man, doesn't fit into this. But there's some other recommendations. So here's an adult over 26. It's not routinely recommended, but there may be reasons to, to do it. But maybe he is immune compromised, in which case it is recommended. Or maybe he's a man who has sex with men, in which case it is recommended. So that's kind of a bit of a tip that you could do for, for any vaccine or, or any um, vaccine preventable disease on trying to figure out for this particular person, is this vaccine recommended? 
The next question would come up, let's say our 32 year old man in the waiting room is a man who has sex with men. So we're gonna read through this and say, yep, this vaccine is recommended for you, but is it funded? We have received advice that um, the next update does plan to include whether a vaccine that is recommended is funded or not, not currently in the handbook. The way we would find out that information is if we go back home, is seeing if it's on the NIP. And that's gonna, if we clicked on that, it's gonna open up to this page here, which has got all your information about whether a vaccine is funded and who is funded for catch up. The purpose of today is to stick with the handbook. I just wanted to let you know how to get to that. So that is, I guess, the first tip in navigating the handbook. If we want to know about a particular disease, a particular vaccine, we're going to go in by, by chapter and do it that way. Um, another spot to click on when we're going in by vaccine preventable disease is, let's use meningococcal as an example for this one, is all those really tricky bits of this seems to be outside of what I've been told about this vaccine is variations from product information. So again, we've gone to that by going, I've read the product information for meningococcal disease, uh, meningococcal B vaccine. I've got a six week old child in the waiting room and they're requesting meningococcal B vaccine. The product information says I need to give it from eight weeks. Can I give it with their six week vaccines? And that's a really tricky question. The place to find that information is deep down in the bottom of the handbook, this variations from product information. So to answer that question, can I give a meningococcal B vaccine to a six week old? We're gonna go diseases, meningococcal disease, and down to variations from product information. And this is where you're gonna find all kinds of information that really is additional advice that ATAGI is giving about those particular vaccines, which might be different to the product information. So we're trying to answer our question about meningococcal B vaccine. So we'd go down here to Bexero, and we would be looking here, it says the product information for Bexero states that this vaccine is for people aged greater than two months, but ATAGI recommends it can be given to people from six weeks of age. So that's an example of the odds and sods questions and, and where that information would typically sit in the handbook. So let's um, say the next learning goal is catch up recommendations. So if we're looking for catch up, we've got two ways to get to that. We're back on our home page. We've got a child in who, who's overdue for vaccines and we're trying to organize a catch up. So we could click on these handbook quick links, or you can go straight to the taskbar across the top and click on catch up. This is where you're gonna find all things relating to organizing a catch up schedule. There's some quick links um, to some international resources. There's quick links to the, the catch up calculator. Um, everything you could possibly want to organize a catch up is in this particular chapter. And you're not necessarily going to find the best answer to your questions for catch up purposes by searching by disease. So that's why I've separated those two points. So if we're looking at a catch up vaccination, there's two particular points I wanted to direct you to. One of them is the principles of catch up vaccination. And this is where we've got some of you, your quick tips around what we might consider about catch up vaccination. Things like um, the, the schedule may change depending on the child's age, um, less doses may be required depending on the, the child's age. We can co-administer vaccines. And this, this particular Point. The second point from the bottom is a common question relating to catch up vaccination, which states that some people need further doses of antigens that are only available in combined vaccines. In general, it is acceptable to use combination vaccines, even if this means that the number of doses of another antigen exceeds the number required in a schedule. So this is really the spot in the handbook that that indicates to you that yes, it is okay to, for example, use an infant rix hexa for a child when 
only one dose of Hib was was needed, and we're going to be giving them an additional dose of Hib. So the handbook um, is permissive with things like that, and that's where you're going to find it in writing to support making those kind of decisions. The next helpful part for catch up vaccination is if you click up here on this page or you just scroll on back up to the top. Um, catch up guidelines for individual vaccines for children aged less than 10. This is, if we click on that, it's going to scroll a lot. This is your Bible for catch up vaccination. Um, it breaks it down by antigen or group of antigens um, and it, it gives you that real specific advice around how many doses are needed for each antigen, what's the intervals required, um, minimum age for, for administering those vaccines. I'm going to touch back on that in a minute um, and what to do if, if it's being given too young or, too, or the interval's too short. Um, and this is where you're going to find some things like um, your tables for HIV vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine when you're trying to figure out how many doses are needed for the child. So you really can only scroll through this by antigen. So we keep scrolling. You can see hepatitis B. We can read all about what's recommended for hepatitis B. We've got HIV, what's recommended for HIV. And we scroll down and we've got our, our tables where we're going to really look at how many doses has this child previously had? How, how old are they? And how old were they when those doses were administered to get our answers? You've got the same for pneumococcal. Um, you keep scrolling, it goes through each antigen. This is really your Bible for catch up vaccination. Um, and this will should be used in, in conjunction with your catch-up calculator um, to, to really, your catch-up calculator won't give you things like say using the combined infant rix hexa to reduce number of needles for your child. So you will do the, you'll vaccinate the child and get them up to date just following the calculator, but you can kind of read through this and um, add a, a layer of clinical acumen to, re, to um, I guess, reduce your needles and things like that. Now, I, I said I'd touch back on minimum intervals. So this is all, all catch up, lots of information there. If we go back on up, you might think at times, oh, look, what was the minimum age that I can give this vaccine? Or what's the minimum interval that I can give this vaccine? Or I'm sure that I saw that recommendation in a table somewhere, but you're clicking through the diseases chapter, there's lots of information there and you just can't find it. So this is the resources tab. So if you, again, you landed back at the home screen for your, you've accessed the handbook, you're gonna click across onto the side, across the top here onto resources. And let's say I'm going to use the minimum age and minimum intervals as an example. I'm doing a catch up and I want to know what's the minimum intervals that I can give these vaccines. So I type in minimum into here. And it's going to bring me up all the tables that use the word minimum. So let's say we're looking for minimum intervals. How close together can I give these vaccines? And this is going to tell you the absolute minimum interval that you can administer these vaccines. The hepatitis B is, is a really common question um, because it's, it's quite, quite complex. And this is where this information now lives. Those of us who can remember the paper handbook, the information for your absolute minimum intervals between hepatitis B vaccines used to be in the diseases section. It no longer lives there, it lives in these tables. So some things that you, you just cannot find, this is a really good way to try and find that information. Um, so this is listing all of your vaccines that are relevant for children less than 10, and then the absolute minimum interval that you can administer them. If we go back, then we've got the, we've, we've got our scenario 
the family have come in too young, what is the absolute minimum age that I can administer these vaccines? And this is really handy table that's got your absolute minimum age that you can administer these vaccines. Um, heading on down mostly six weeks and noting that you've then got what to do if it's inadvertently given below the recommended age. So we've gone and given that vaccine below six weeks. If it's between 28 days and 42 days, it does not necessarily need to be repeated. The next vaccine can be given on time. So that is handy. And I just wanted to take you to, then we've got catch up schedule for people greater than 10, which if you were looking for the minimum interval between vaccines, you wouldn't necessarily think to think to go to that table. However, this is the table which gives you your vaccine intervals for adults and people greater than 10. Um, and again, directing you to the, the hepatitis B component is, is quite complex and that's where that information now lives if you're looking for it. I did spend a whole day finding that one, so really worth tagging that particular page. Um, and my, the final tip I just wanted to show you where to go to is um, special risk groups. So this is a, a common spot that's often really tricky to navigate. So if we come back home, we're looking like we're on the homepage of the immunisation handbook. There's a few different ways to get to our special risk groups. So this is um, somebody's come in after completing cancer treatment, what vaccines should I give, you, give them? Somebody's had a um, bone marrow transplant, what vaccine should I give them? That I, I remember that's really complex, what do I need to do? So things like that. So this is, there's some hyperlinks down the bottom here for vaccination for special risk groups, which might take you straight there. If immune compromise is a common question, you could just click on that. Um, what, what extra vaccines can I give to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Click straight there on that. But if you want to view the entire list, you're going to have to come up here and go to contents and then go to vaccination for special risk groups. And then this is the entire list of additional advice for, for people that are sitting in a special risk group which who need some additional consideration about what vaccines we want to give them. So let's go into, where's my bone marrow transplant? Ooh. Oh, yeah, this, this is why it's complex. So first we're going to click on who, people who are immune compromised. And then we've got to go down and find um, the hematopoietic stem tra cell transplant recipients, which is then going to take you down to all of the re additional recommendations for, for those guys. And there is your table. That one's not so easy to read. So an extra tip is if we go in and click on, on the table, it'll open it up in the full screen and make it a little bit easier to view and giving you a really specific schedule on, on what to do. Um, there's no consistency. So say we want to do um, people who have had cancer, you'd think maybe there'd be a nice table for, to catch up people who have had cancer. There is not a nice table. There's a whole bunch of texts for people who have had cancer that really go down by um, by vaccine and what the recommendations are for them. Um, and you've got a few few dot points, but not in a table. Um, that's really, so the special risk groups is quite complex and you, you really probably, if you've got a patient coming in who fits into a special risk group, probably want to spend a little bit of time um, finding their particular chapter and reading through, through what you want to do for them. And finally, say for example, now we've just said that it would be really nice if the recommendations for people who have recovered from cancer, if that information was in a table, like it's really confusing. You've got it in a table for stem cell transplant, but not for, for cancer. 
feedback is encouraged that the handbook is for us, it is for immunizers, it is to inform your practice. Um, so what you would do is you're on that page. I really, I think this is a really good recommendation. We're going to click down here. Is there something wrong with this page? You can click on that and say, I was trying to find recommendations for people with cancer and it was really confusing. It would be really great if this information was presented in a table and that would make it less confusing. You know, can you look into that? Um, then you just click submit and, and off it goes. So that, that's a really valuable way to be feeding into um, making the handbook user friendly. Um, so that was basically what I wanted to click through and just give you the quickest guided tour as you possibly can on often when you call us we're, we're asking you guys to click here click there and trying to to skill you up so you have access to the information that's kind of what it looks like on some of the common places we would be asking you to click. I did put together a little slide stack which will be made available that has some links to those sections of the handbook I've just directed you to if you're wanting to just jump in and, and click on some links and have a look at the resource page or the, the special risk groups page. And I'm going to pause there and just um, get Kirsty and Sharon back on to go through any questions before our time's up. We've got about seven minutes for a couple of questions. Hi Rebecca, great presentation. Um, no questions, just comments really in the chat. So Sandra um, has, um, thank you very much for the presentation, that was very helpful and also just she made a note that um, the link to the handbook is also found in Health Pathways. Um, so for those practice staff that are um, uh, looking at health pathways a lot, there's a link directly to the immunisation handbook there through the health professionals section. So just cup, um, two comments, really no questions at this stage unless anyone wants to quickly put something in the chat there now. Very good and Health Pathways is an amazing resource. Um, lots of work goes into that and really, really appreciate the work those guys do. Nope, no questions coming through. Uh, just one here now from Sandra. Just um, did Rebecca want to mention the changes to the AP reporting and where to find the link? No worries if not. Rebecca would love to. Um, for those online who haven't heard me bang on about it before, AFIS is one of my passions, um, which we have, again, it's um, now live on Health Pathways. You may have heard us talk about encouraging online reporting for ease of use for you guys um, and quicker response times from us. And we've now provided all those links on her health pathways as well, including um, access to a QR code if you're wanting to just stick that in your pocket and report on from your phone in between patients. I think, does Jenny want to come back in and finish this yeah. off or shall I send everybody <laughs> off to go and make a cup of coffee? Everyone can go and have their lunch now. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was um, great and it wasn't too fast. It was a great pace. Um, and remember everyone, it, it is recorded um, and Rebecca has, is also providing some slides that we'll put up with the recording with all the links um, and some screenshots to make it even easier. Well, thank you so much for your time today and um, we'll catch you next time. Thank you.